everyone, I'm Tony Lontis and this is the Everyday Business Show. I'm going to do it to the best of my ability because if I fail, that means I fail for my entire female nation, I call it. <laughs> Is that possible? That was the question for myself. And it is absolutely possible. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Everyday Business Show. I'm your host, Tony Lontis. And if you're joining us today, uh, we want to say, Thank you for coming and listening to The Business Show. Welcome to everyone listening in the US, across Canada, Asia, the UK, and across Europe. Welcome to the show. Now, if you're listening live on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitch, or Twitter, we have the delightful Hannah in the background ready and waiting to take your comments, answer your questions, and provide you with links about anything that we talk about on the show today. A quick reminder too, I'd love you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's simply Tony Lontis. Type it into YouTube and you will find me. We'd love some more subscribers. We're trying to hit certain milestones each and every week and we're doing really good, but I would love you to come and hang out with us on YouTube. Don't forget that the replays of these shows are available on Tony TV on all L uh, LG, Roku and Samsung smart TVs across the planet. Now, something that we do that's special each and every week, and that is part of an international movement that acknowledges the special and important role Indigenous communities play in our development of our country's cultural identity. So I want to respectfully acknowledge the people of the Yugamba region Gold Coast, Queensland, Australia, the traditional owners of the land in which we meet and broadcast and pay my respects to the elders past and present and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders here listening, watching and present today. We have the most amazing guest for you today, Dr. Andrew Stoltz. And here's what you need to know about Dr. Andrew. He is the CEO of A. Stoltz Investment Research. And they help clients create, grow, measure, and protect value. He is also the co-founder of CoffeeWorks. Thailand's leading B2B specialty coffee roaster. Andrew has served two terms of the president as the president of the CFA Society Thailand and during his investment banking career he was voted number one financial analyst, anal, analyst in Thailand. Got my words mixed up. Andrew is also the worst podcast host of my worst investment ever podcast, the number one risk management podcast that helps future generations reduce their investment risk by learning through the stories of others. In addition to his three decades in financial industry and teaching finance, Andrew has written four books and six online courses, among them valuationmasterclass.com, the world's number one practical valuation online course. Andrew, welcome to the show. We've got so much to talk about today. We were talking just a little bit before the show started and bemoaning the fact that sometimes sleep doesn't always come easy. So bear with Dr. Andrew today we have lots to chat about and lots of questions to ask. So, Dr. Andrew, you've had a really long and industrious career in finance, investment banking and financial analysis. But outside of finance, and before we get into that, I want to know what led you to be living in Thailand. What do you love most about the country and what keeps you there versus anywhere else in the world? Right. Well, first of all, uh, Tony, thank you for having me on the show. And hello to everybody out there. Uh, I'm happy to be on and share some of my uh, experience. 
I was a, uh, I grew up in Ohio and everybody mm. looked like me. <laughs> and when I moved to California as a young guy, I just wanted to try something different. I moved from Ohio to California and then all of a sudden the whole world opened up to me and I got yeah. interested in Asia. And then after that, I completed my undergrad in finance at Long Beach State and I got a job offer with Pepsi to work in manufacturing. And mm. Pepsi, basically my boss said, you should take a holiday because you're going to be working your butt off. <laughs> and then I said, all right. So I set up to go to Japan, Thailand and Hong Kong. Mm -hmm just yeah. out of curiosity. So I set all that up. I went to Japan. Then I came to Thailand. I was going to be in each for one week. But in 1989, when I came, it was the Tiananmen Square protest time. <gasps> so Hong Kong was uh, in, having huge protests. So I decided to just yeah. stay in Thailand for two weeks. Uh -huh. For anybody that's listening or viewing knows that if you spend two weeks in Thailand, you yeah. just want to be there. You know, people yeah. are great. I love the interactions. And at that time, it was one of the fastest growing economies in the world. So to move and work here, which I later did, I went back, finished my MBA, yes. worked for Pepsi, and then I moved to Thailand in 1992. And I started my career as a teacher of finance, but I quickly moved into the stock market. And it yeah. was booming. It was one of the most uh, successful economies in the world at the time as far as growth was concerned, and the mm -hmm. stock market was booming. So it, it was part of the reason why I decided to come here, because I felt like there was a lot of opportunity. And I never yeah. left. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you, you wouldn't live anywhere else now, would you, Andrew? I know that you're passionate about yeah. um, Thailand um, and that it's a great place to live. Um, there's differences between Western culture and Asian culture, but for Westerners um, like you and I, there's actually a very it's – a, it's a gentler way of living, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of lessons. If I uh, – somebody asked me, would you go back to America? And if I went back to America and I was a manager – in America or I ran a business and I was running people, it's good. It just my, what I learned in Thailand, I mean, the first thing, uh, one of the big things is that uh, yelling or being very strong in your voice is just absolute no, no. Oh. Everybody will shut down. People will shut down. So you really have to calm yourself. And that's, that's different amazing. from the U S you know, in the U S you know, mm -hmm. you can come in and I'm yeah. mad as a boss. I'm, I'm pissed. I'm upset at this. And, <laughs> And, and even pointing the finger and stuff, that, that kind of thing is just, it's counterproductive here. So that, that has changed me, and I think it changes anybody that's here for a while because yeah. they start, it, it, it smooths off the rough edges. So that's yeah. the first thing, and then you have to think, all right, how do I get, get what I want to get done without that type of, you know, method? Angst. And that, yeah. that challenges you. I think the second yeah. thing that I learned from managing in Thailand is that, Ties are, ties are not great generally. Now, there's some that are great, uh, mm. but generally at setting a system. Okay. But they're very good at following a system. Now, if you go in America, for instance, if I have a young person and, and they start working for me, I may say, all right, look, I want you to set this whole thing up. I'm not going to bother you. And they're like, great, don't bother me. I'll do all the research. I'll set up the filing system. I'll set up the accounting system. I'll set up the production system, whatever. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of challenge that, a, let's say, a Western or American kid would really like. Mm -hmm. But if you do that type of challenge, generally what you're going to find in Thailand is that it's not what they want. What they want is guidance. What ah. they want is support. What they want is help in structuring that. It's just not as big of a skill. And there's that independent streak in America, particularly and maybe in the mm -hmm. West, like I can do this myself. Yeah. But they don't have that streak to that extent. And therefore, as a boss, you really should be more involved in what they're doing, support them, and mm. see when they're having a roadblock, and try to mm. anticipate that, and then support them. And that's something very different that may even get me up. Get if I went back to America and I was managing people that way, it could get them upset. Like, <laughs> get out of my way, get out of my, you know, leave me alone. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> so that that makes for a, a nice working life when you're, you know, working in finance, which is generally seen as, you know, pretty high level energy stuff. Um, Andrew, you're a prolific writer. You've got four books, six online courses, and you've done hundreds of thousands of papers on equity strategy and mm -hmm. company research. I'm wondering, which one's your favorite book and why? Um, I think my favorite book is not about finance. It's the yeah. book I wrote called Transform Your Business with Dr. Deming's 14 Points. And Dr. Deming was the father of the quality movement you know, or mm -hmm. one of the fathers, and he helped the Japanese after World War II. And 
he was uh, okay. he he wrote a book called Out of the Crisis. Mm. That's this book. Yes. Out of the crisis. That's what Dr. Deming looks like for the listeners. They don't see it, but I'm holding up the book. And I basically was, my boss at Pepsi said, look, I think you got a kind of statistical mind. We've mm. got challenges in quality. There's this guy, Dr. Deming, he's doing a seminar. And I think that you should go and attend. And I went and attended that in 1990. And yeah. Dr. Deming was 90 years old. <gasps> and he, was, he taught for two, two and a half days, nonstop. Relentless. Wow. And first of all, as a, as, a, as a person, he inspired me. He inspired Definitely. me to teach to the end of my days. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. want to be teaching and sharing until my last days. That was the first inspiration that he gave me. But the mm -hmm. second thing is that I have a little special place on my bookshelf. I've got about 700 books here in my library at home. And it's just a handful of books that flipped my mind. You know, and that really changed my trajectory of my life. And his is one of them, Out of the Crisis, because he <sighs> basically showed that the typical way that we're managing businesses in the West mm. is, is not the best way to do it. And once I learned that, I really wanted to share that with the employees in one of my businesses, which is a coffee factory, Coffee Works in Thailand. So I decided I would write out in simple terms his 14 points and then... We translated it into Thai and translated it into uh, Chinese and then used yeah. it to train and teach the staff in, in our coffee business. Amazing. I'm going to digress for a moment and talk about coffee. What was it that got you into coffee? Because you're the co-founder of Coffee Works in Thailand. And um, I know that you, you uh, still are the major shareholder in the company. But what yeah. got you into coffee? Well, I was actually a tea. Coffee in Thailand? Yeah, exactly. I was a tea drinker when I came to ta uh -huh. Thailand. I didn't yes. know much about coffee, and um, but my best friend from high school, we knew each other since we were about fourteen. His name's Dale. Uh, Dale was studying Japanese in Japan while I was in Thailand, mm -hmm. and so Dale popped over to visit me in Thailand, mm -hmm. and he said, "This was about 1994," and Dale said, "Coffee's terrible here." I didn't know <laughs> that because I wasn't drinking it. <laughs> and basically, the result of that was he said, let's start a coffee business. And we had, and I said, wow. well, I'm making good money. I was an analyst at the time, and he had free time. So we said, mm -hmm. let's set that up. And so we set it up 50-50. He ran the business, and I mm -hmm. did my best to fund it and make sure that the finances and accounting were, were strong. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then we started that, that business. So that's uh, 27, 28 years ago, and that business Amazing. is still going. So that was my first startup. Yeah. Wow. So, Andrew, do you source the coffee from Thailand? Is it, is, it, is it a Thailand coffee branded or just out of Thailand? Well, Thai, first of all, Thailand is a pretty big coffee growing market, but mainly yeah. they're growing Robusta coffee. Mm -hmm. And Robusta coffee is grown at sea level. Uh -huh. So if you think about it, everybody goes to Phuket and Samui mm -hmm. and these types of places. These are all sea level. So in mm -hmm. the south... That's where the majority of coffee is grown. In the mountains, there is coffee, the Arabica coffee, and we use yeah. mainly we use that Arabica. So I would say we're probably about 50% import, 50% Thai coffee. It just depends on what our customers want. There is mm -hmm. an import tax. There's almost 100% import tax on coffee. Ah. So if somebody says, I want a really great, I want to be able to serve, let's say a hotel chain that says, I want to serve amazing Hawaiian coffee, you know, Kona yes. coffee. It's mm -hmm. going to be double the price of what it would be if they were selling that in another market. And so uh -huh. that's where there's a, there's a, there's a taste price yes. conflict that we have to resolve for them to then try to hit the price point and the taste. So ultimately the taste depends on uh, what we say is quality is ultimately in the cup quality. It is every so many things can go wrong in the process yeah. of growing and transporting and roasting I was gonna and, ask and you brewing about that. coffee. Yeah. It's like there's 50 steps that if one goes wrong, it's over. And I'm guessing that all of those things have gone wrong at some point in that 28-year journey, yeah? Well, I, I'll tell you a story about when we first started out. We were just young guys, and I had a good job <laughs> in, in an investment bank, and I was making good money, and I was rising up fast. And it was about 1995 we started the business, and Dale had moved here. In 1996, we started sales. Our sales were pretty small, but we were looking forward to 1997 being a big mm -hmm. year when we were going to take off. 
Yeah. But then what happened is on one Monday, uh, on June, uh, July 3rd of 1997, I walked into the office and I found out that the Thai bot had been devalued. Originally, it was 25 baht for every $1. By the end of 1997, it was 60 baht for every $1. Oh. And what does this mean? This basically means that uh, funding and everything, all the money that was coming into Thailand all of a sudden got super expensive. And the Thai mm. economy crashed by 11% in 1998. Ooh. And basically, it was, it was kind of the, the, the beginning of a collapse in the stock market that ended up falling by 90%. Oh, that's a, that's a big fall. Yeah. So that's, that's the Asian crisis. And it was, yes. you know, it was a massive big. thing. And basically, we could see our customers disappearing <laughs> day by day. So by 1998, we decided that in order to survive, we would have to move out of our apartment. We would move into our factory, and we cleared out okay. the accounting office, and we set up two beds in there just like we were bunking in, at university. Yeah. I still have my job. I was generating cash, but we didn't have revenue, that much revenue, and we had a lot of costs. And you can't just shut it down, and there's nobody to buy the. We just had to sit on it and try to figure out how to survive. Yeah. And then in April of 1998, I got a message from my boss that we can't, we got to close. So my company I was working for shut down. My income source closed. The coffee oh business gosh. is you know, in a difficult situation. And here we are living in the factory. If you can imagine out in the jungles of Thailand, outside yes. of the Bangkok, yes. it was, it was yes. like jungle. And you're really living, if you're living in the factory, you're living in one room because you're not mm -hmm. air conditioning the whole factory, but you're air conditioning one room. That room. So if you can imagine Dale and I you know, struggling to keep ourselves sane and keep the business alive, it was a very, very difficult time. But there was one day in particular that was the most difficult. And that was mm -hmm. in the middle of, it was a Sunday in the middle of August. And I don't know about for the listeners and the viewers out there, but if you've ever been in a torrential downpour, you, you know wow. that sound, that smell, just, yep. you know, like it's intense. And in, in Asia, it can be very intense. It was mm -hmm. a Sunday and it was a dark day with torrential downpours. And that's that smell of, of, of wet Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> Dale and I had woken up and we were cleaning up, showering up or whatever. And then we were sitting on the beds and I got a call from my older sister. And she said that her cancer had come back. And the doctor said she was going to live for a month. And she asked me, please come home as soon as you can. Oh. And when I hung up that phone, I just sobbed. And I, I feel the pain right now. Dale and I had gone from riding high and all that to be at mm -hmm. the absolute bottom from a business perspective and then to have this personal bottom of potentially mm -hmm. losing my sister. I got on an airplane and I flew back. She, she lived outside of Boston. I flew back. I remember, I remember that landing. You know the excitement you feel when you're landing after yes. a long flight? You know, yes. it's really exciting. And it is a long flight from <clears throat> Thailand yeah, to Boston. Yeah, it's a long, long flight. And I remember landing in Boston and the whole approach, I was sobbing because I just thought, this is the last time I'm landing to see my sister. And I, I got to my sister's bed, and I climbed into bed with her, and I gave her a big hug, and then she taught me a lesson that I've carried for the rest of my life. I started sobbing. I started sobbing because, you know, all the pain that I felt and all that was going on, and there she was, you know, really, really suffering. Yeah. And yeah. she just looked at me and she said something, Tony, that I'll never forget. She said, that doesn't help me. No. <sighs> and I was like, wow, all this time I've been thinking about how her death impacts me. Yeah, what about? Instead of thinking about how it impacts her and her family and her three beautiful daughters and her husband and mm -hmm. so many things. Mm -hmm. And how selfish I was. And she really taught me a lesson that, you know, when people are going through pain, when, when we're going through death in our family and all that, if you can bring yourself out of your own suffering and understand the other people's suffering, you bring a lot more value to the situation. Yeah. <clears throat> but you just become a more, you just become a better person. And she taught me that. Yeah. My sister unfortunately passed away just a week after that. And then she left three beautiful daughters. And mm. that was the origin of the book that I wrote called How to Start Building Your Wealth Investing in the Stock Market because I felt like as an uncle, I wanted to give them something. And what I basically did is I, when they each turned 18, I flew back to America for their high school graduation. I gave them each $3,000. And mm. 
and I helped him set up an investment account. And I wrote the book, How to Start Building Your Wealth, Investing in the Stock Market, to guide them how to do that and so that they could take care of money on their own. So that's where the origin of that book came from. I have five nieces, two from my other sister who's still alive. Yeah. And so all five of my nieces have gotten that same gift and that same, um, you know, encouragement. Amazing. 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 Yeah. Wow. Um, so a lot of what you've done since that time is actually about education and, and helping. And I understand that you still lecture in Thailand. Yep. It's really important, that next generation of education, isn't it, Andrew? Yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm a teacher. I love sharing what I've learned. And I'm not afraid to share what I've learned because I'm not afraid of other people. You know, I have my own unique angle on stuff. And Absolutely. So I share that. And that, that's, so that's one thing as I don't have any fear of sharing what I'm doing. Um, and then the other thing is just that originally when I started my own business, A Starts Investment Research, mm. I, you know, I think like a lot of your listeners who have their own business uh and viewers, basically, I would say selling is hard for most people. Oh, yeah. Absolutely and, agree. I mean, it's the, it's the only really profession out there where you can just get, you can get emotionally destroyed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. just you yep. know, when you're working in a factory, you're not going to have anybody go say, no, never call me again. You know, that just doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah. So That's right. basically what I realize is that I can sell, and I, I read a great book. I have so many books that I love, but I have I'm a I'm loving your called. library there. Yeah. I'm loving that this library. Is another book called The Ultimate Sales Machine by Chet Holmes. Uh, Chet Holmes mm -hmm. has passed away, but his, this book is a great one. But he taught me years ago that we can sell through education. Mm. And so what I do is I teach, and my objective is to teach so well that my students say, what else can I get from you? Uh-huh. Yeah. And so that's what I try to do is bring as much value as I can to yeah. every interaction so that people say, what more can I get from you? Yeah. And Andrew, it's about the, the stories. Um, an integral part of learning is around stories because you will remember a story that's linked to a certain element or a certain truth or a certain way to do things. If there's a story that sits behind that, um, it helps cement that, particularly in adult minds and adult learning, yep. that storytelling is in, so important, isn't it? I've incorporated that in all my courses that I have what I would say repetition and story. Yep. Repetition meaning I state, okay, here's what you're going to learn, then I teach it, and then I say, here's what you learn. And I make sure that my summaries of what they learn in that section, let's say a 10-minute, 20-minute section, that it's very clear, like they could just copy the bullet points at the bottom of the course, at the bottom of that PDF yeah. or whatever, yeah. and say, okay, that's what I need. And then I also provide them workbooks where I summarize that so mm -hmm. that they really can get it. So there's repetition is one part, but the storytelling, um, actually, when I really started realizing that uh, we can build a competitive advantage through our storytelling yeah, was when I, I was talking into the camera like we're sitting here now yes. and I was teaching a course about finance and I was explaining, you know, what is inventory? And I said, well, think about my coffee business. Mm -hmm. Green coffee is raw material. Yes. And we bring that raw material into a work in process where we're roasting it and all that. And what comes out is finished goods inventory. Mm -hmm. And that's this bag. And I thought, well, I'll just get a picture. So I got a picture of the green coffee from the factory, and I got a picture yeah. of the bag from the factory. I got a picture of the roasting machine from the factory. I said, there's green coffee. That's the inventory, raw, uh, raw materials. And yeah. there's work in process, and there's finished goods. And somebody said to me, you know, I really love the way you told the story of Coffee Works. Yeah. And you used that, and I thought, wow, okay. I could be one differentiating point is that there's not that many finance professors that have a business like that. So to be able to incorporate that, and, and now I, I, I take pictures in the factory and I bring it into my courses, and then I make sure that whenever I have, you know, a 10 minutes of content, I've got to have at least one story. Story. So I spend a lot of time and I have a story slide that has a campfire on it, and then I yes. say, I got to get a story in here. I know it's just too much material. I've got to stop, and I've come, got to come up with a story of my own experience. So that builds a competitive advantage, and for anybody out there that's listening or viewing who is teaching, uh, mm. 
interject stories on a regular basis and it's going to make a huge difference. Definitely, definitely. I know that when I flipped the idea around interviews to focus on the story, um, it's so much more interesting and engaging for the audience and you want to deliver something that's interesting and engaging and that they will get something from and some takeaway. Um Andrew, you also do um, seminars, and um, those seminars focus on eight key areas. What are those, and why those topics? Well, I've basically, if you think about my business, you know, I bring a finance mind to business. Yeah. And um, what I try to teach people is that finance adds no value in business. Okay. Now, this is very upsetting if you're a finance <laughs> CFO or if you're a, a financial student yeah, and you're I... just studying it. But what I say is that finance is a, is a mirror. Mm -hmm. Finance is a reflection. It is a measurement of management decision-making. And when we understand finance like that, we understand that finance is a supporting role. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, value in a business is created through management decisions and the products and services that they create and deliver. Mm -hmm. And finance is just a collection of all the data, of how much did you sell and how much did it cost and how do we... And then what Dr. Deming taught me was the idea that, you know, in business, if you're a manager of any business, business is all about... It's scientific because you're, 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 you're developing a hypothesis. I'm going to yes. do this Facebook ad and it's going to generate... I'm going to spend $5,000 and it's going to generate $50,000 in revenue. Mm -hmm. That is a hypothesis. Because it's unproven. You yeah, it can't be. It's impossible to prove until you do it. And so mm -hmm. then execution of a management idea is the next thing. Okay, how well did you execute it, you know, and all that. Let's just say you execute it really well. Mm -hmm. And let's say that you brought in, instead of bringing in 50000 for the 5000 you spent, let's say you brought in 6000 mm -hmm. Now, if you hadn't, set your goal at 50 or thought, this is my hypothesis, there wouldn't be as much that you could learn from that. But when you set a hypothesis and then you test it, mm -hmm. there's a huge amount of learning now that you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the role of finance, in my uh, view, is to provide constant feedback to... Now, business is not about, you know, always about... I got this hypothesis, I got that. We're just taking action using hypothesis as we're going mm -hmm. along. But the question is, how does it, what is the result of that? Mm -hmm. And so um, I have, I've, I've interviewed a lot of people who have lost their money in startups and I've yeah. lost money in startups, I've made money in startups, but I would say I always give one piece of advice to startup uh, companies and that is close your books every single month. I mean a complete close, balance sheet, income statement, cash flow. Now, most people aren't doing this. They'll have their accountants just do it every six months or every 12 months, mm -hmm. or they'll just have them submit the tax document. No, close every month. Okay. And then take an hour or two with yourself, your accountant, your CFO, your management team, and review those numbers. Mm -hmm. If you're doing that, you're already ahead of almost everybody out there. Ah, what a valuable piece of advice. And Andrew, does that go does that go even for small business who's just like starting out? Is it a, is it a core uh, fundamental to start from the get-go? I think it's even more important there because when you're yeah. a small business, you have very limited resources. Yeah. You have your time and maybe one or two other people and a small yeah. budget. You need real-time information. Because also, we know that the majority of small businesses fail. Mm. And by getting feedback from the financial statements, you can more quickly assess whether what you're doing is going to be successful or not. Yeah. And you can make adjustments. But what happens is most people, they say, I'm not a numbers person. I, I don't know about that. And I, I also, many times, from my experience working with companies, is that they hide it because they're intimidated by it or because they know that they're probably losing money, because they yeah. know their idea is not really working out as much as they thought, they hide it. And when you hide it, you know, the, the light, the light is the ultimate, you know, revealer okay. and it brings truth. And so 
if you are someone's listening or viewing this and they're they're hiding from their financials, you've got to stop that, doing that immediately. And you've basically got so to say, each how do month, I get it? Every yeah, month. Each month you've got to look and go, okay, well, this is not working. It's not generating the type of cash flow and revenue that I need to keep going. So then you've got to look at, okay, do we stop doing that and do something else? Do we stop yep. selling that product and do something else? Did you have to do those exercises with the coffee startup too, Andrew? Constantly. Uh-huh. Constantly. Uh-huh. You know, and we thought this would work and it didn't. And we thought we had the right product or service. We thought we had the right messaging. It happens all the time to all of us. Yeah. Um, and I that's call okay, it, isn't it? Yeah. And I call it, it's, it's the chasing revenue stage of business. Right. Because most of us get in our mind that we've got a great product or service we want to bring to the market, but we don't test it. Most people don't test it with the market. Mm -hmm. So they just go out. They spend a lot of time developing it. They take that out to the market, and then they get smacked in the face when they realize nobody – I designed this for me without any awareness of really what the market wanted. So then you've got to say, okay, now I don't have revenue from that. Now I've got to find revenue somewhere. What can I do to get revenue? So you're you're juggling and you're you're chasing revenue. And – that's yeah. kind of stage one of startup. And eventually yes. you identify. Now, some people are lucky enough that they identify the revenue stream right up front. They got it right. And mm-hmm. they're just focused in on that revenue stream. But for many people, they end up in that stage, I'd say, I call it chasing revenue. Andrew, how much time do you allocate to that process of learning, revising, pivoting, changing, working out the the, the revenue portion of the business? So, if, for example, if you're only getting a limited revenue source from that particular product. How long is it before you go, oh, I give up? So <clears throat> this is the importance of getting financial data on a consistent, regular basis because yeah. that helps you to make that decision because you can start to see, okay, when are we going to run out of money? Um, <clears throat> instead of talking about it in terms of time, mm-hmm. I would, I'll flip it and talk about it in terms of uh, volume, revenue. Yes. yes Basically yes. what... What, what I learned from my experience with Coffee Works was that getting from zero to $1 million, let's yes. say in revenue as an example, is an amazing feat of a single man or woman. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's an amazing feat already for anybody to be able to go from zero. But chances are it's probably a one-man show, a one-woman show. Right. Yeah, it, it, it just takes the, the grit of one person to drive that. Yeah. But the problem that you face is that in order to compete in the business world, you need to turn that into an operating business. And that Mm. means you need infrastructure. You need a good Mm. accounting system. You need a good management information system. You may need enterprise resource planning system. You may, you know, you're going to need all, and then you're going to need a head of marketing. You're going to need a head of sales. You're going to need a head of, you know, production or whatever those different departments are that Mm. you yourself have through the sheer will and effort, have gotten your revenue up to a million. Fantastic. But now what I learned is that you've got to get to 3 to $5 million in revenue as fast as you can. Why? Because that oh. is the level where you have enough uh, revenue to support the management team that you need to professionalize to your business going. and the infrastructure that you need to professionalize your business and truly compete. So whenever someone comes to me saying they want to start up a business, and they say, well, we think we're going to be profitable and this, but, you know, this, that. I go, all I care about is when are you going to get to $3 million in revenue? Ah, gee, that's good advice, Andrew. Yeah. So the $3 million is the sweet spot. So essentially you can probably get there as a sole person with a small team. Um, you can get to the million, but your next <coughs> KPI, your next milestone should be that $3 million. Definitely. And... Also, <clears throat> what most people don't, you know, one part of my business, so if, if you look at my business, I help people create, grow, yes. measure, and protect value. Mm-hmm. We create value through business. Yeah. And <clears throat> we measure value. I, I calculate the value of businesses all the time. That's my, yeah. that's one part of that's my business. Opinion. And it's also my valuation masterclass that I teach people yes. around the world how to do that. But what happens is that when you have a business that's got, let's say, a million dollars of revenue and you as an individual built it to that, Mm. you pretty much have nothing. Yeah. 
If yeah, somebody, yeah. if you think I'm going to sell my business or whatever, no, nobody's going to buy that. It's a one man show, one woman show. It doesn't have the infrastructure. And all that's going to happen is they're going to think, okay, we're going to pay for this and you're going to walk out that door. We're going to, we may lock you in for a year or two, but the minute you walk mm -hmm. out that door, there's no systems that can sustain it. And therefore, yeah. your business is not worth much at all. And Fair so enough. that's yeah. the other reason why you've got to get to three to five million dollars because then you have then built a systematic way of doing business that somebody would be willing to buy. And Andrew, that's essentially what you do now is help businesses in that process. Yep. Yeah, yeah and I basically what I what I have one part of my business is I, I call it that I help CEOs and owners make their companies financially world class. Mm. So I look at 25,000 companies across the world. I measure their performance on a quarterly basis. I break them down into sectors. So you wouldn't yeah. want to compare a utility company against a telecom company or a consumer company against a manufacturing company. Uh -huh. So I've got them into 10 different sectors and then I break them down into large, medium and small because you wouldn't want to compare a large company against a fast growth, tiny company. Why? You want yeah. to. So once I've identified what sector that the company's in and what size uh, category the company's in, then maybe let's just say there's a thousand companies in that space across the world. Then mm -hmm. I look at that particular company and say, how does it rank on a scale of one to 10, meaning 10 deciles? Number one would yeah. be best, number 10 would be worst. And then that I'd measure of something I call profitable growth. And profitable growth is a combination of profitability and growth. And that, mm -hmm. that measure is something I use when I'm investing people's money, but it's mm -hmm. also something I do when I'm working with people on how to make more out of their business. How do you maximize profitability and growth? And yeah. that's really, and then I think that making a company financially world-class is actually not that difficult. It requires yeah. a commitment to it. It requires a management team. And it requires a commitment to it, and it requires consistent follow-up. And basically, I teach to my clients that I teach them how to understand the financials. And then I, then I give them the scorecard and maybe mm -hmm. show them the scorecard of their company and maybe some of their competitors so that they understand their strengths and weaknesses relative to their competitors. Mm -hmm. And then basically, for those that want the full mentoring, basically what I do is say on a monthly basis, I work with the management team. I break management team up into four part. So anybody listening to this could do it. Just say, yeah. I want one person responsible for revenue, one person for expense, one person for assets, and one person for risk. Those are the four okay. drivers of value. Right? If you can increase yeah. your revenue, if you can decrease your expenses, if you can get more out of the assets that you have in place or get rid of assets that aren't producing, and if mm -hmm. you can reduce your risk. It just happens to be REAR, R-E-A-R. And so I teach it like that. And that's a that's theoretically as a professor of finance, that yes. is a theoretically sound model as far as the calculation of the value of a business. But it's also a simple model to help a management team focus uh, yeah, and, and break focus. down the silos between, oh, I'm sales, you're marketing, you're production, you're human resource. No, we got to drive these four factors of this business. And that's how you make a company financially world class. Mm. Andrew, I wanted to go back to something you mentioned earlier in that conversation. And, and you spoke about fa a small, fast growing company. And I'm curious to know what determines fast growth? Are there multiple things that determine fast growth? Or is it, is it, is it kind of simpler? I'm curious from your expertise. Well, let's, 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 I'm going to answer another question that will give us a guidepost. Uh -huh. So I, I took the top 10,000 companies in the world yep. and I looked at their financial statements every year for 20 years. And <clears throat> that's already a huge amount of work to do that. And then yes. to, make sure that I cal to make sure that I calculate the growth correctly uh, is even more work because sometimes mm -hmm. you may add a company to that aggregate of companies and the adding of that company didn't necessarily add revenue growth to the unit. It just yeah. made the unit of companies larger. So I have to make some adjustments for that. So, but why I'm telling you this is because I calculated the average annual growth rate of revenue of these companies over 20 years. That means ups and downs cycles. Yeah. Yeah. And for those and there companies, will be ups and downs, won't there? 
Definitely. You got to look at it over a whole economic, one or two economic cycles. Uh -huh. I think most people are surprised with the number, but the number is 6%. Okay. And I think most people are kind of surprised. They think it would be growing faster than that. But 6% is the average revenue growth of the average large company in the world. Mm -hmm. And then I did a little study myself on, I looked at a bunch of companies that had been, their share prices went up quite a bit. Yeah. And I gathered a, a huge number of these companies that had very large uh, share price performance over a long period of time. And I decided, well, I wonder what their revenue growth was on average. Mm -hmm. And what I found was that their revenue growth on average was about 10%. Okay. Still, now, I would not, have thought it would have been much numbers. higher. Yeah, no, yeah. no, no, yeah, that, that's the thing. Now, okay, that's so like now achievable. let's... achievable. Even in my mind, that's kind of achievable. Yeah. Now, let's go back to the original question that you asked, you know, what's fast growth for a startup? Mm -hmm. Well, a startup company may be growing at 50%, you know, 100%, 500%. Oh, yeah. Now, generally what I say when you're talking about a startup company, you don't use percentages. Yeah. I mean, anybody that talks about their new company and talks about percentage, it's pretty much meaningless because the denominator yeah. is very low. Mm. So you made $10,000 last year, now you made $100,000. You grew by 10 times. Well, yeah. it's not really... It's not. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. therefore, in the first, you know, in, in the period of time until you get up to, let's say, I don't know, let's say half a million dollars or a million dollars or something like that, mm. I would just speak in terms of numbers. Last year we mm -hmm. did 200000 This year we do 400000 We did 400000 Mm-hmm. Once you start to get up to bigger numbers, it also gets harder to grow it, you know, as consistently. And then I would say that if you were a small company that got above a million dollars in revenue and then you were growing at 20%, mm. 30%, mm. that's fantastic. Yeah. You know, and if you say, well, I want to grow 100%, yeah, it's possible. It's possible. But yeah. I would say that if, if, if we actually, if, if we went down and looked at that group of companies we probably would calculate that they probably are growing at 15 to 20 percent. Remember that some of them go from, let's say, a million dollars in revenue to zero because they close. So yeah. then that's a whole thing from the academic space of survivorship bias. Many people calculate things and they don't calculate it right mm -hmm. because they remove that company that went from a million to zero. Mm -hmm. And that's a 100 percent decline. Yeah that they take out and then they think that they're calculating the right number, but in fact they're not. So the numbers aren't as high as you think. So No, they're uh, not. That's really encouraging. Here's another actually. way. Here's another way of looking at it. I have yeah. on my YouTube channel I put up mm. I just I I'm kind of random in my YouTube uh, <laughs> stuff. I don't have as many I've That's looked okay. at yours. But I, I, I went through Warren Buffett's uh, latest letter to his investors and mm. I I was looking to it and I was calculating and he had calculations, but he showed that his average and let's say the stock market over the 57 years he's been investing money. Yeah. The stock market went up by 10% on average each year. Okay. Which is very high when you consider from a long-term perspective, yeah. if you were to bring that back to 1930 or something like that, you would be talking about something closer to 8%. So it was a good time, first of all. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. Warren Buffett is probably the best investor in the world that we know, yeah. right? There are yeah, some yeah. others, but generally he's consistently invested over time. And then, yeah. then it's a question of, okay, so that's kind of the upper limit. You know, if you think you're going to earn a return better than Warren Buffett, I mean. Go for it. but Go for it, but chances, chances are aren't great. probably not. So he's yeah. a big. So the first thing that I calculated was his, um, his success ratio. And that's just mm -hmm. saying, okay. In, in, in any one year, did he perform better than the market? Let's say the market went up by 15% and yeah. he went up by 20. Let's say the market went uh, up by 5% and he went down by 20, then he underperformed the market. So all we're looking at yes. in this type of success ratio is just the number of years that he outperformed the market. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what the calculation of that comes out to is 67% of the time he outperformed the market. Whoa. So, that's you know, yeah, I mean, that that's, and for us that now as, as we get older, we start to understand odds. That is the best investor in the world, 67%. Mm. Mm. So if you've got an yeah. investment strategy that's, that's returning you 55%, not bad. Yeah. If you could improve it to 60%, that would be amazing. Amazing. Right? Yeah. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is that Warren Buffett's performance was 20% on average each yeah. year compared mm -hmm. to the market at 
Mm -hmm. So he did double the market performance. Now that, from a compounding fact, when you allow that to compound over 57 yeah, years, it means that it's 200 times higher at the end of the period. But most people never leave their money in the market like that. He was a guy that left his money in the market. Is that a key, Andrew? Leaving it's, your money? Making good well, that's, decisions that's but leaving That's part of the lesson it? I taught in the, the book for my nieces is that mm. there's only really one sure way you can get rich in the stock market and that is to leave your money in it for 30, 40, 50 years. Warren Buffett is mm. getting up to 60 years of leaving money in the market. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, what you could see from uh, Warren Buffett's performance, if you break it down by decade, yeah. it was the 70s that he had a huge performance. Amazing performance. So he mm -hmm. started in about 1965 for this record. He may have been yeah. doing some investing before, but for the record that he keeps for Berkshire Hathaway when he took over, yes. that's yeah. 1965. 1970, it was just an amazing, his returns were huge. Yeah. If you look at his performance from then, it wasn't that great. It wasn't 20%, you know, it wasn't two times the market. It was maybe mm. 1.5 or 1.4. So it's a, it a little bit better, maybe 14%, 15%. But what happened was in the 70s, he made a huge amount of money in his investments. They went well. And he let that compound over many, many, oh. many, many decades. And we wouldn't have known Warren Buffett if it hadn't been for the gains he made in the 70s, 70s. and leaving it in the market to compound. So time is the surest way to get rich in the stock market. And that's why I wanted to start my nieces when they were 18 to say, mm -hmm. let's say you're 20 years old, you want to retire when you're 60, you've got 40 Stop. years to let that money compound. Wow. What great advice, Andrew. Um, I'm looking at the time and thinking, oh my goodness, I've got so many more things to ask you. But <laughs> the, the one that I really need to talk about is you describe yourself as the worst podcast host of the worst investment ever podcast, which is actually not true, by the way. Um, it's a number one risk management podcast and Andrew is actually a phenomenal host. Um, I know because I've been on your show. Um, Episode 525. <laughs> the podcast itself, where can people hear these amazing stories? Because your podcast is full of this amazing nuggets of information. Mm, Where's the best yep. place that they can listen? Well, um, why don't we have a little fun? Yes. Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. That is the intro to the podcast. And it is. you can find it at myworstinvestmentever.com. You just type in my worst investment. I mean, how many people are out there competing with me in that space? There's nobody you out know. there. <laughs> and, and, who if wants you're to be and if you're driving while you're listening to this, it'll be in the notes underneath the, wherever you're watching this uh, video. And you can jump on to tonylaundis.com and find them there under my guest section where you will find all of Andrew's information all of his links and also the link to his podcast as well because you'll get lots of nuggets from that, lots of simple tips, tricks and interesting stories that will help you on your way to building wealth and understanding finance, which is a huge area. Now, the other thing that I wanted to quickly ask you, because it's a fascination of mine, um, Angel, you describe yourself as an angel investor and I wanted you to to tell the audience what an angel investor is, why they do it, and why investment is so important. Mm. So an angel investor is that person that comes along just when you've been developing your idea and maybe you've been testing it, you've been spending a little bit of your small amount of money that you've got to test your idea. Or and the angel, the angel is the one that comes to your shoulder and says, I like your idea and I want to fund it and let's get it to the next stage. And it's not a very formal process compared to a really? venture capitalist or a private equity and all those things are, they, yeah, yeah. they get much more sophisticated. So mm -hmm. a typical angel could be an uncle, a cousin, a brother, a friend, someone in the neighborhood. It could be, you know, there are now angel syndicates where angels get together and they all start to bring to bring interesting investments into a group. And ultimately, if you want to be an angel investor, I would say that you should really be investing in 10 companies, not one, because it's just the probabilities are just really, really low that one is going to survive because it's just, you know, it's a competitive world out there. It is. It is indeed. So a group 
Investing in 10 companies will have better outcomes than just picking one. Yeah, I mean, wow. remember, that is a method to reduce risk. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and that's where I think a lot, a lot of people are like, no, risk. Andrew, but it's my cousin and he's got this great idea and all mm -hmm. that. Yeah, yeah, I know. But you're taking on a huge amount of risk if you're yeah. devoting your money only to that. If you're going to angel invest, you really probably spread should look out. for some syndicates and try to spread that out. Okay. Good advice, Andrew. Um, one of the things that you are also passionate about, and um, as we're running out of time, I'm going to skip straight to this because it is important. Um, will you, uh, women in valuation and the scholarship your company offers specifically for women. So I wanted to finalize the, the show talking about this because it's so important. You and I both know that statistically yep. speaking, women are not equivalent in terms of investment, in terms of access to angel funds, investment funds, capital funds. We are just not on the same playing field. And part of what you do and part of your work is around helping women understand the finance industry. So tell us about Women in Valuation and the scholarship. So I had two sisters and then I had five nieces and um, I've been surrounded by women. So I've always, um, you know. Awesome. I, yeah, it's just, so uh, basically Thailand is also a place where women have a huge role in the financial world here in Thailand. They are dominant oh. in the financial world, really, as Fantastic. far as leadership positions. So it's very you know, common. But when I went outside of Thailand, I saw that's not that common. So I decided to come up with a Women in Valuation Scholarship. And what I do is I partner with organizations that have the objective to give women more access. And ultimately, in my case, it's to help them get better jobs in the world of finance and build a competitive advantage in valuation. Yeah. If I only went out there for my course, uh, the mm -hmm. valuation masterclass, and I went out there uh, just broadly advertising, I'm going to get about 80 to 90 percent men, about 10 to 20 percent women. But with the oh, Women in Valuation Scholarship, what I get is about 50-50. And so I just graduated um, 30 students from the valuation masterclass boot camp, and more than half of them were women, and many of them came in under the Women in Valuation Scholarship I did together with CFA Society in this particular yeah. case. But I'm always looking for women organizations that would like to help women who have knowledge and skills in engineering, in finance, in business, or whatever, that really want to build a competitive advantage and get a job and get a great job and a mm -hmm. high-paying job in the world of finance. So that's really my, my uh, contribution. That's amazing, Andrew. And it's not open. I mean, it's open to any woman who uh, is interested in this yeah, so uh, basically, area? they've got to have a passion to learn valuation. It's not yeah. easy. There's a lot of work involved. Oh. They gotta, but they don't have to have a lot of background in it because I start from the ground up. But they got to have that passion. Uh, mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is that as of right now, I market this through organizations. Mm -hmm. and so it's so organizations take, that need yeah, to take, connect with you. Yeah, so if uh, any women organizations that are trying to get more women in the workforce or that, or any company even that says, mm -hmm. I need more women on my research operation, then mm -hmm. I can work with them and then we can get that scholarship out. And what I'm trying to do is engage organizations and provide them with a tool mm -hmm. to achieve their goals. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And that's really what it is. I do have other scholarships. I have something called the Future Finance Star Scholarship, which is oh. men and women. Yeah. And that's something that, you know, people can, um, I, I can send you a link to the Future Finance Star Scholarship. Yeah. So yeah. if any of them, you know, anybody wants to apply, Absolutely. you can apply. But the Women and Evaluation we'll on one the is, website. yeah, it's really trying to figure out what organizations out there really want to empower women to build careers in finance. Yeah. Amazing. Andrew, we are out of time. I could continue talking for yet another hour. Um, so many wonderful insights. And um, I think I'll have to get you back on the show um, at another stage to revisit some of these conversations because they're really fascinating. I don't know anyone who talks um, as uh, matter-of-factly as you do and explains it in a way that's so easily understandable by, by so many people including myself. Um, Andrew, thank you so much for being on the Everyday Business Show. People, remember that if you need to find information on how to get in con contact with Andrew to find about 
uh, his courses, his books, uh, information about the scholarship and anything that Andrew does. He has a wealth of expertise and experience in finance across many, many areas of interest, uh, world-class professor and lecturer. And I encourage you to reach out and chat to Andrew if you've got any questions. That is your lot for this week. Dr. Andrew Stoltz, Thank you very much indeed for coming on Everyday Business today. I hope to get you back later on in the year to have another chat. That, my friends, is a lot for this week. And we'll be back next week on the Everyday Business Show talking to another amazing entrepreneur, business owner, company CEO, whoever fills that spot next week. It'll be a great show. Dr. Andrew, thank you so much. Bye for now. Thanks for having me. I'm going to do it to the best of my ability because if I fail, that means I fail for my entire female nation, I call it. Is that possible?